Uh, hello, welcome to the live broadcast uh, from Glasgow COP26. My name is Nadia Rosli. I am project director with Internews in Malaysia and a freelance environmental journalist. The Earth Journalism Network, EGN, a project of Internews, and the Stanley Center for Peace and Security have brought 22 journalists from developing countries to cover the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, or COP26, as part of the Ch Climate Change Media Partnership Program, or CCMP. This is an annual fellowship to the Climate Change Conference, which started in 2007. The CCMP organizers believe that it is critical for journalists from low and middle income countries to have the opportunity to report live from COP. But this year, obviously, it is more difficult than ever for them to attend because of COVID-19 travel restrictions. And through this live broadcast, we hope they can serve as an additional resource for journalists who are not able to make it here in person. We will host this live broadcast for half an hour, starting from November 8th until the 13th, and we will touch on a different theme every day. We will feature three speakers, a trainer, and a fellow from the CCMP program, and an external speaker. For today's theme, we will be touching on climate change and health. Yesterday, a group of 50 countries have committed to develop climate resi resilient and low carbon health systems at COP26 in response to the growing evidence of the impact on climate change on people's health. 45 of these countries has, have also committed to transform their, their health systems to be more sustainable and low carbon. 14 have set a target date to reach net zero carbon emissions on or before 2050, which altogether accounts for more than 35% of global healthcare emission. To speak on the intersection of climate change with health today, especially on the types of stories that journalists are pursuing, we have three speakers. Our first speaker is Jody Gupta, an award-winning environmental journalist from India and director at Internews Earth Journalism Network, third pole project. Later, we will have Disha Shetty, a journalist with Health Policy Watch India. And lastly, we will have Antonella Riso, International Climate Technical and Research, Research Manager from Healthcare Without Harm. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, Mr. Joy Dick Gupta. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, Joy Dick, you as the director of the Topo Project, you write and commission articles on climate change, biodiversity, pollution, and sustainable development for the bilingual environmental news website, www.thethirdpole.net. Uh, you are a lead trainer at workshops for environmental journalists from South Asia and Southeast Asia. You've covered, you've covered the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio, the UN Climate Summits in, Brazil, in Bali, Poznan, Copenhagen, Cancun, Dubai, and Paris, and the Biodiversity Summit in, in Nagoya. So as a COP veteran, um, which leads are you following this year? And why do you think they are important to you, uh, especially uh, as a journalist from India? COP is very important to the whole world and even more crucially to the entire developing world. Because as I'm sure you know, you are a reporter yourself from Malaysia, uh, in all our countries, whether developed or developing, we are already facing the impacts of climate change. So we now have to have a situation of how do we tackle this? We have to have a strategy of how do we tackle this situation the current situation, we have to more importantly, perhaps have a strategy to make sure the situation doesn't get worse, that we don't keep adding more and more warming gases, the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And it is at the COP where countries, all national governments get together and at least try to make a change, to make a dent to this climate change, which has become such a huge problem all over the world already that it's affecting every aspect of our lives. There's nobody who's now free of the impacts of climate change in any part of the world. That's why any attempt to talk and discuss and come up with a strategy on how to combat climate change becomes crucial for all of us. Um, I would like to touch on as well, you know, you've been the lead trainer for uh, this, this kind of conferences for many journalists, um, especially from the global south. Uh, 
what's your main advice for them? Because I remember you said something quite reaffirming at, at the first briefing we had, uh, which is the knowledge you know that you've had when you attended your first COP and until now. And I think it really resonates with uh, journalists who are uh, pre, uh, you know covering this for the first time or who would like to get into climate journalism since uh, these kind of conferences can be very overwhelming and confusing. So what's the main advice that you'd like to, to basically impart to this journal? There is actually only one word of advice. Plan your day. Plan your day in advance. Because it, it, this conference of parties at the end of the day is a huge conference. There are thousands and thousands of experts here, government negotiators here, observers and journalists over here. There are dozens and dozens of very interesting events going on at the same time in different rooms. Simultaneously, there are negotiations going on. So what will you do? What will you cover? What is of interest to your audience? That deciding that and planning your day on the basis of that becomes crucial because otherwise, yes, it's not just a question of coming something that happens to you in the first COP. It can happen. It happens to me even today that if I have not planned my day, that in the middle of the day, I suddenly find, oh, this is also happening. That's also happening. Where do I go? How do I run you know, from this part of the COP to the other? So yes, planning your day according to your audience is the crucial bit. So today we will touch up a lot more on climate uh, change and health. So can you talk about the engagement of stories on climate change and health that you've observed on the thirdpool.net? And um, why do you feel it is important to make that connection to readers? Um, for example, do you have any um, do you have any impactful stories that you like to touch on regarding vulnerable communities or underreported issues that you've published on your platform and has actually really resonated with your readers? Let me start my answer by asking you a question. You are a journalist covering these issues in a tropical country. Have you ever in your journalistic career found a story or found a case eh, where somebody has died and the cause of death has been written down by a doctor as heat stroke? Have you ever found? You will not find it because the entire health profession is not in the same page as the climate change professionals. And that is a very, very serious problem that we are facing, that the world is facing today. And yes, through our stories, we are trying to figure that out, how to bridge that gap, because it's a very crucial gap that needs to be bridged as soon as possible, in fact, sooner than yesterday. It needs to be bridged. Uh, there are climate change impact is impacting human health already in very, very serious ways. The trouble is that we are having trouble doing stories on it. Policymakers are having trouble taking action on it because people are dying because of climate change, but the cause of death is being written officially as something else. And um, maybe if you want to give an example of um, maybe some of the stories that uh, your platform has published where these kind of linkages are clearly made and, and what kind of comments uh, or feedback have you received from those who have read those stories? Yeah, so there is this very, very common thing. Now, you go ask any doctor. You, you live in Kuala Lumpur? Yes. Go ask any doctor in Kuala Lumpur. That doctor, are you seeing more cases of high blood pressure okay among your patients and 95 percent of the doctors will tell you yes we are seeing hmm? and then look at the causes high blood pressure we have been told by doctors by the medical profession is because we are not exercising enough we are eating fatty foods we are eating too much salt but now Go ask the professionals who is getting high blood pressure. You will find farmers are getting high blood pressure. 
fishers are getting high blood pressure fishers wives are getting high blood pressure they are not people who are eating fatty foods they are not people who are not doing enough exercise they live on the basis of physical exercise why are they getting high blood pressure they are getting high blood pressure because those of them who live in on the coast or near the coast are drinking water that is getting increasingly salty because of sea level rise which is an impact of climate change doctors are understanding this and it is a very serious problem disha as a specialized health journalist will be able to tell you more about the impacts of high blood pressure uh, on especially on women especially on pregnant women who are suffering from preeclampsia who are suffering from miscarriages as a result of this and here is the problem when you, we want to write about it when policy makers want to do something about it we find almost no epidemiological studies which we can cite so the prop, this is my call out to the health profession that when you get the, your next patient and you are checking his or her blood pressure please keep a record because the doctors do not keep a record of this and this is the problem and this is why we are unable to prove the stories that we need to show, prove Uh, thank you so much for the explanation and for your very important work at the Third Floor Project. We have a question from the audience um, for Jody. As someone who has attended many COPs, what is your take on the state of climate reporting, especially in developing countries? Are there persisting challenges, and how is CCMP helping to to overcome this obstacle? Climate reporting, especially in developing countries, is improving very fast is growing very fast and today climate reporting in developing countries is far superior to climate reporting in more, almost all developed countries there are you can always name certain exceptional media outlets in developed countries which are doing very good work but the average level of climate reportage in developing countries is far higher than the average level of climate reportage in developed countries the reason is simple developing countries because most of them are between the tropics of cancer and capricorn because they are in the hotter parts of the world anyway are facing the climate impacts more it's not that the developed countries are not facing it. they are i mean you look at the floods in germany and the wildfires in europe and australia and you look at the heat wave in the pacific coast whether it's in the us or canada so they're all facing it but yes developing countries are facing it more because they happen to be in the tropics more, almost all of them so that is why reporters have realized this so what's the problem the question was what is the problem the problem as i find it are two one is to convince their editors that this is a story now this is a problem that can be easily overcome by any thoughtful reporter who can convince his or her editor that this is what's happening on the ground the second problem and that's a genuine problem is that like all media outlets all over the world every media outlet is suffering from budget cuts budget shortages to do a good climate story you need to travel you need to go and meet people in the communities you need to find out what they're doing and many many media houses now in fact most media houses are unable to fund that crap that's where an organization like the internews or journalism network comes in because through our media capacity building workshops through our story plans these are the gaps we are bridging we are providing the reporters with the capacity to be able to argue their case with the editors to be able to write better stories to be able to do better stories and we are also providing them with the money with which they can go out report and come back with great stories thank you so much and i thank hope you. that the journalists here can uh, take uh, jodi's tips and uh, to pursue more climate reporting after this uh, thank you so much thank Next. you thank you we will have our uh, disha so disha shetty is an independent science journalist based in india 
who writes on public health, environment, and gender. She is the winner of ICFG's 2018 Global Health Reporting Contest Award. Disha has a master's in science, environment, and medicine journalism from Columbia University. So welcome, Disha. Thank you so much for having me here. So I would just start off by asking you, so you specialize in writing on health stories um, and making that linkage to climate change. That's right. So what are some of the key headlines here uh, coming out of COP that uh, out of COP26 that you've been focusing on uh, and the, the kind of people that you've been arranging interview with, uh, interviews with for your stories? Right. So firstly, this is my first COP, uh, but I've reported on climate and health for a, a few years now, uh, mostly from a developing country perspective. I'm based in India. Um, so at this COP, I, I feel that climate is certainly a growing conversation. And from what my interviews tell me about the past COPs in comparison, there is a, a significantly more conversation happening here. Uh, clim uh, health is still not a part of the main climate negotiations, not a part in the text, and we haven't really reached that point yet. Um, but we have organizations like MSF, Doctors Without Borders, who are here this time for the first time. Um, and we, we have a lot of representation from um, civil society organizations that are focused on climate and health conversations. Uh, the WHO uh, had a side event on uh, uh, climate and air pollution and the, uh, the multiple gains of improving our air. And there was also a side event on uh, uh, climate change and its public health impacts that was day long uh, last weekend. Uh, and so I'd say that uh, health conversations are surely growing, but we aren't really seeing uh, them as being equally important as a climate crisis as yet. So because this is your first COP, um, you know, being here for for the, I mean, for this uh, several days that you've been here, um, do you have any experiences where uh, certain uh, events that you've attended or certain people you've spoken to have really challenged your own assumptions about how you're reporting these stories and what you want to bring, um, you know, back to to home and beyond the, uh, beyond the COP. Yeah, I would actually say that uh, for me, I, I have a growing frustration with how long it's taking for us to uh, recognize that climate crisis is a health crisis, uh, because any climate change story that I report on automatically tends to have a public health fallout, whether it's air pollution, whether it's heat waves, so extreme weather events linked to climate change. All of that translates directly in uh, um, public health issues. So if there are rising floods, for instance, or any natural disaster, you will have public health fallouts of that. So for me, uh, I feel like the scope is uh, uh, not yet there in terms of what we need, because uh, back home, what my reporting tells me and show what I see during my reporting, I feel like I need a public health need and I need to recognize that uh, uh, the, the amount of resources we would need um that hasn't been met yet and it's it's far from being met right now uh, for someone who you know has been writing about this topic for for quite a while I, i'm sure you make these kind of links very easily or you see this link very clearly in your work but maybe this is not as obvious to a journalist who's not necessarily specializing in this field or writing a lot about climate reporting or uh, climate journalism so uh, the connection between health and climate change uh, is often overlooked, I guess, uh, in newsrooms. So as a journalist, how do you make these linkages clearer to the public? Um, what kind of tools and also uh, topics do you use to, to get that attention from the public? Right. So because I was first a public health reporter and then I started writing about environment, for me, the impacts, the public health impacts just leap in front of my eyes. Um, so for instance, if I'm writing about a water crisis in a particular community, uh, I talk to the women and they obviously tell me about their joint pains, uh, how they have to walk longer to fill uh, water for their families, how they don't drink enough water to save water. Uh, and, and of course, then if you ask follow up questions to them, they'll talk about a lot of health issues. So I think it'll help for us as journalists to be mindful of the fact that our questions need to also be geared towards, um, are you feeling any public health impacts? Are you feeling, uh, has disease patterns in your community changed? Do you go to the doctor more often for some reason? 
uh, uh, are you not feeling well? How does your body feel? How do you feel? How does your mental health feel? Um, because depression linked to climate change is a huge issue across communities. Uh, and because of extreme weather events, people uh, have a lot of mental, mental health fallouts and that is across sectors. Um, so definitely in, in the farming sector. So I think you have to ask these questions very intentionally. But before that, you, you have to be aware that there will be these fallouts. Uh, and then you could go to, I think that there are experts studying these issues, uh, not as many, but there are these experts looking at the intersection of, let's say, air pollution and health, um, heat waves and health. And you just have to look at Google Scholar to try to find them. I often um, use references. I ask my experts to suggest other experts because it's it tends to be such a small field. And that's one good way of finding more experts. Um, so just being intentional about it helps. And, uh, intention, and going to Google Scholar and trying to find experts who might not have researched this intersection in maybe your country, but maybe in some other country that could have takeaways for you. That would also help as a journalist. So what kind of stories uh, will you be pursuing beyond this conference that maybe uh, you've gotten some story ideas from this conference that you want to actually pursue uh, these stories more of when, when you're back home? Right. So firstly, uh, one of the things that I was looking out for was how much of... Uh, a conversation public health is at COP at all. Um, and it's nice to see that it is a growing conversation. Uh, as, as somebody who's been covering the air pollution issue for a long time, for me now, I feel like the next step is why are we not talking about air pollution and women? Because we know that uh, women are disproportionately affected by air pollution. We know that there is an impact on maternal health, rising miscarriages, uh, uh, pregnancy complications, stillbirths. Uh, also, uh, in a lot of developing countries, because uh, uh, fuel wood still continues to be used, um, so we um, uh, we don't talk about this the disproportionate impact on women as much. So that for me is one of the stories that uh, I would like to pursue going forward. Thank you so much, Disha. Uh, we will take questions uh, from the audience for Disha. Uh, so please put them in the chat box, uh, chat box and we will actually uh, forward them to Disha later. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So next, uh, we will have Antonella Lariso, who leads the Healthcare Without Harms work to support hospitals and health systems around the world in measuring, tracking, and reducing their climate footprint. She will also support healthcare initiatives for climate resilience and leadership. Uh, for the past eight years, Antonella served as technical project coordinator for Healthcare Without Harm in Latin America, helping build the organization's global green and healthy hospitals network into a vibrant region-wide constellation of hospitals and health systems, while providing training assistance and developing tracking and reporting tools for its members. She has also worked on sustainability issues with Argentina's Ministry of Health. Hello, Nadia. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello. If they're listening Hello. Be in Indonesia. Thanks for inviting us today. So thank you, Antila, for joining us uh, via Zoom today. So obviously, um, you know, we, we did mention about the commitment uh, that was announced yesterday. So can you explain a bit more on uh, firstly, what, what does your organization do, the healthcare without harm? And what do you mean by environmentally responsible healthcare? Okay, so yeah, thank you. We are an NGO, an international NGO, a coalition too. We are present in all regions. We are present in Indonesia. We have members there in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa. And the commitment announced yesterday, these 50 countries that committed on resilience in many cases and mitigation is because of what the previous were saying. The healthcare sector, it's part of the problem because it's a highly polluting sector sometimes. And it's also, a key line of defense on the effect, the effect on climate change. So we work on both with countries, with a sector and with others like researchers trying to identify the impacts on mental health, on physical health, on, on the infrastructure and others. So we work together. And you ask me, what do we mean by 
again like um, but, um you your you on your website um healthcare without harm yeah it says that you work yeah. um you know towards environmentally responsible healthcare so maybe can okay. you explain yeah, yeah. What, what that yeah means? yeah it's related of what i'm saying because the sector is key but when healthcare without harm was created 25 years ago it was due to knowing that, for example, the waste, in the incineration of medical waste was a source of more cancer in some communities around the world. So, uh, so th that is when we mean environmentally responsible, because you as a sector, sometimes some call it an industry, are a very complex one. Uh, the sector economically could be the 10% of the GDP of a country and the emissions could and the sector represents globally approximately five percent of the emissions global emissions so the sector is big it's essential it's key to have a stronger healthcare systems around the world in all countries it's made in a way that doesn't harm communities and hopefully in 20 30 years that doesn't contribute to climate change so that's why we mean by that um going back to yesterday's commitment um could you please uh explain how this would actually translate on the ground uh, with the health, health sector in terms of activities and programs and also the role of health practitioners um, in changing the health system to implement this commitment um, and maybe how do these health priorities fit into um, nationally determined contributions as well yeah yeah oh, last year argentina in latin america was the first country to introduce this perspective Sorry, Antonella, I think your connection um, is lagging. Did we lose Antonella? I'm back. I just, okay, I'm going great. to close okay. the camera. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm going to close the camera just in case. All right. Can you listen? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Can, yes. Yeah, what I'm saying, what does this mean on the ground? This is already happening on the ground. That's probably something important for you to know. For example, Many facilities and healthcare systems in Southeast Asia are already making assessments to know how vulnerable they are to climate change. And some are starting to make, we call these baselines, to know their emissions, to assess their emissions so they can see where they are and develop their action plans. That is already happening on the ground. We could say that one year ago, we only had one system in the world with a clear plan to get to zero emissions in 2040, and that was the NHS. Yesterday, we announced 50 countries with similar commitments. So that's a huge growth in just one year, where climate and health and finally get understood as one thing that we need to solve. And on the ground, what we need to see next year is a lot more action, a lot more action here on COP, but also side COP, as you said, on the ground, we are going to, we need to see systems and we are going to work with them, developing their baseline, identifying their emissions, developing their action plans, assessing their own vulnerabilities. And all of us, the ones, the big community on climate and change, contributing for that to happen because many of these countries are going to us need help, not only financial support, but technical support and these networks to be really strong so we can all solve it together. Um, do you feel there are any underreported stories in the media about climate change and health, uh, whether there are any trends in the sector that journalists should be paying attention to and maybe, um, you know, to, to cover better? Well, I would say like the forced migrations that we already see related to climate change should be a lot more covered. That would be good. And I think that the, and the other thing that Dr. Maria Neira from W. Choble says, the 7 million people there every year for air pollution, that's something that a lot more people should know because that's a very, very big number. So we know that fossil fuels kill 7 million people a year. And that is a strong argument for climate action, I think. So um, we do have a question from, from the audience. So um, someone's asking, what are the reasons for the fact that the health sector is considered a big polluter? 
Oh, it's it's a huge sector. Every sector contributes to climate change, but probably education, a, a school where it doesn't have the type of equipment or the supply chain. Imagine a hospital, high complexity hospital. It has boilers, a lot of equipment. If you are in intensive care, well, you need a lot of resources for that to work. And that is okay. What we need to work for that is to be as sustainable as possible. And if we don't have solutions, create them. The NHS just presented this week at COP the first zero emissions ambulance. They don't, they just don't exist. But the NHS, through an in innovation fund, the industry to create them, and they are not going to exist. So we have many things like that. The sector uses lots of plastics, lots of disposable plastics. We need to change that. So that's why the sector is a big polluter too. But there are many leaders in the world working to reduce that. So we are part of that and we're working with many that are trying to change that. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I think we are a bit short on time, but just want you to answer one last question, if you may. Um, what are some of yeah. the entry points for journalists to cover uh, and make better linkages between climate change and health? Like who should they speak to, for instance? Um, what kind of resources can they tap into to um, cover the stories? We have resources. Uh, if this person speaks in Spanish, our Latin American office develop a guideline for journalists to cover climate change with a health perspective. We have resources and we have leadership. Set. So we could probably, Nadia, be in contact with this person. So because we have our comms teams in Asia, we have comms teams everywhere that are specialized on this. So we have resources. And I think we have a toolkit in South in Southeast Asia too. So if we can, you can put us in contact. I could, I could send the links later because we do have resources and entry points on how to uh, help the audience really to understand this and not trying to only to depress people in a way because this this can be sometimes like too much to handle right because it's it's bad but there's a lot uh, of room for hope i think and all all this collective action that we're seeing at cop and their commitments that we're seeing even though if we're seeing that we are not achieving every everything that we want we're seeing a growth momentum and i think that climate and health communities are they're not stepping back and med students are activating around the world and we can solve it. So it would be good to tell it from the good stories. For example, how med students are being are organized around the world. There's an organization that has more than a million doctors that are, many of them are at COP right now calling for climate action. So I think that's probably one way to do it. Okay, thank you so much, Antonella. Um, if it's possible for you to just put the links of those resources you mentioned earlier into the chat box so that uh, whoever's joining us today can just quickly access them um, while I actually close uh, this session today. Okay. So thank you. Let me try because I have such a bad connection, but let, let me try. <laughs> so thank you so much to all our speakers today um, for joining us on day three of this live broadcast. And for those who have been tuning in um, from day one, or even if you just joined us today, Thank you so much and we hope this has been helpful for you as a journalist um, to cover better stories on climate change and health. Mm -hmm. So for resources on COP26 and other tick sheets for your for climate journalists, you can visit um, www.earthjournalism.net slash COP26 and a recording of this will be available on the same website. For tomorrow's team, we will be linking local to global policies and commitments and we will have speakers Imelda Abanyu from Philippines and Alfreda, Kevin, and Ricci, who are both uh, trainer and fellows here at COP26. And we will have external speaker, Jonathan Lin, who is the head communications and media relations from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC. So thank you for joining us today. We will have three more broadcasts until Saturday and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Stay safe. Thank you very much for this, Nadia, and all of your team. Bye. -bye.